welcome everybody to Lessons for Coastal Communities. This is the second webinar in the Reset 21 series hosted by the Southampton Institute of Arts and Humanities at the University of Southampton in collaboration with the Coastal Creative Network of South Coast Universities. My name is Joanna Safair and I'm Professor of Archaeology and Co-Director of the Institute which both develops and advocates for evidence-based arts and humanities led research for social benefit. Before I hand over to our excellent chair, Bob Seeley, MBE MP for the Isle of Wight, I'd just like to say the usual few words on housekeeping. Please keep your microphone and camera off during the webinar. The chat function has been switched off for attendees but the Q&A box is available if you would like to ask questions and please do uh, enter your questions. The webinar is being recorded and will be available to view on the Institute website and our YouTube channel after the event. So I now have the great privilege of introducing our panel chair, Bob Seeley. Bob is Hi. the Member of Parliament for the Isle of Wight and sits on the House of Commons Foreign Affairs Select Committee. He has lived in the Soviet Union and post-Soviet states, working as foreign correspondent for the Times and as a special correspondent for the Washington Post. He's had a distinguished military career and has written academically and journalistically on strategic doctrine and foreign affairs, as well as more generally on non-conventional and new forms of conflict. Closer to home, he has long and deep lasting connections with the Isle of Wight. Indeed, I believe that he was once quoted as saying that representing the island is like being married to the right woman. He's passionate about the role of heritage and culture in providing solutions to regional challenges and in using the arts to drive inspiration, aspiration, education and regeneration. Bob, I'm delighted to hand over to you to chair today's events and to introduce our panel. Joe, thank you very much indeed. I think that's probably the most flattering uh, intro I've ever had. And uh, I think it's the first time ever anyone's ever described my military career as distinguished. Uh, so, but um, uh, thank you. Thank you. I feel rather embarrassed, actually, but that's very much kind of you. Um, I'm going to very briefly introduce our panel. Well, give them a few minutes each to outline some, some key points. Um, um, but before I just let you know who's going to be on, uh, I'm going to outline the agenda because we're trying to make this a, a free flowing conversation. And actually, because I want to try and find out enough uh, as much as possible myself. Um, uh, we're going to try to make the intros quite brief. Um, I will occasionally maybe interject. We're going to try to outline, as I say, for about two or three minutes, uh, people's key points and ask them to introduce themselves and then go into questions. So as I say, we can make it as free flowing as possible. Culture for me is really important. I'm just completely frustrated by the fact that for 200 years, the Isle of Wight, 150 years, the Isle of Wight was one of the critical places for arts and culture, not only in the UK, but frankly in the world. So much was produced there, not only Turner sketchbooks, but we had a lot of artists who came to the island uh, to paint, to sketch, to get away from the mainland. We had artistic communities. We had the Bonchurch School of Painters. We had the, uh, the Freshwater set in the 1850s to the 1880s. Tennyson, Tennyson's brother, Charles Tennyson Turner. We had poets and painters uh, and artists galore. And I say sometimes slightly flippantly, but with a, with a genuine sense of angst behind it, that, you know, the Lake District, one poet, 20 million visitors a year. The Isle of Wight, lots of poets, lots of painters, 2 million visitors a year. Uh, I, I'm, I don't mean literally that people should be coming just because the painters and artists were there. But there's stuff, the island inspired so much great art. And it is my huge frustration that since World War II, due to a lack of leadership really on the island, we have forgotten about our unique cultural heritage. And that cultural heritage is really important for me because A, I'm passionate about the island because it is the best place in the world. Secondly, it's actually incredibly valuable because art and beauty has a value in itself. But look, it's really important for the visitor economy. Did anyone ever consider to pitch for the Tate St. Ives to, to come to Ventnor, Tate Ventnor, Tate Coastal? No, why not? You know, because we should have been doing this. And last, but by no means least, it is absolutely critical for education as well, because we need to give youngsters on the island from whatever their social background, class, race, whatever, we need to say that great things are possible. 
whether you're here or whether you're elsewhere, be inspired by some of the greatest people born in the last few hundred years and the amazing work that they produce. Whether it's Tennyson being, uh, you know, that, that wonderful poem, Crossing the Bar, about crossing the Solent. So it's a physical crossing of the Solent, but it was the metaphysical crossing of life into death. Or whether it was Tennyson um, writing in, 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 in Maud about the sound of the, the waves on the coast and the screech uh, that the, the retreating waves made uh, on the rocks as well. And I just have a passion for this stuff. And I just think it's really valuable for many, many reasons. And I want to try to learn how we can get more culture back on the island. Okay, that's my um, slight rant over. Uh, I'm going to introduce Alan, Alison Smith, Culture and Heritage Sector Professional, Matthew McKeague, CEO of the uh, Architectural Heritage Foundation, Dr. Suzanne Johnson from the University of Chichester, Seth Geddes from the Winchester School of Art, um, and also uh, Jack from the Isle of Wight as well, who's joined us quite late notice, Jack Whitewood from a, uh, the Ventnor Exchange, but Jack also organises uh, the Ventnor Festival, which is basically like the, Vent the Edinburgh Festival used to be about 40 years ago. So it, it is a, a fantastic thing. Uh, and if you're free, come down to the island uh, for the Ventnor Festival this summer. Jack, it's all, it's all happening, isn't it? Because I've, I've seen your emails, uh, you're pumping out the stuff really, aren't you now? We hope so. <laughs> Fantastic. Right. On, on that on that happy note, I'm going to start with Alison. Alison, can I just in the in sort of two to three minutes, can you just say just a couple of sentences about yourself uh, and what do you think of the subject area, which I probably should have included? It's lessons that we can learn that our region can learn from culture led solutions to leveling up and the challenges that coastal communities have. Uh, and, and what national lessons can we learn for our region as well? But really, I'm looking for how can we use culture to drive all sorts of betterment, whether it's just an appreciation of beauty of art, whether it's education, whether it's aspiration, and whether it's a visitor economy. So can I just have a couple of sentences on, on each? And uh, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, thanks for the intro, Bob. Yeah, absolutely. Pleased to do that. So um, as Bob said, I'm a heritage sector professional, but I'm also an academic. Um, I'm a social social scientist, a doctoral researcher at Bournemouth University. And my work explores the interrelationship between uh, the practice of public engagement and participation in culture and regeneration outcomes. Now, in particular, that's how we might evidence and measure them. And my case study is a coastal regeneration project, a, a large scale one that's absolutely sought to be place based and to transform the place it's going into. And in my consultancy work, um, I support a wide range of cultural organisations, be they places of worship, museums, or galleries, uh, heritage sites, local authorities um, and universities. And I, I do that in three ways. One, I help organisations deliver heritage projects working with communities uh, as equal collaborators. Uh, two, I support organisations uh, to help them respond strategically to policy agendas, especially in sort of very changing complex cultural contexts. And again, to help them evidence their impact, whether that's to statutory partners or to funders. And also I help organisations, cultural organisations to become more resilient, and in particular through business planning and funding. I think so my particular contribution to, to the conversation that will follow will be that sort of intersection between my research and my practice which says that in order to have these really effective coastal regeneration projects, or, or indeed actually regeneration projects anywhere, what's really necessary is that we facilitate that effective engagement and participation with communities. And I would situate that as absolutely critical to the success of these cultural place-based regeneration projects. And it's not really a one, although my, my, my research is, is attempting to settle on some sort of model for this, I think that really this is something that's incredibly complex, it's very nuanced, it's very, very different, it operates at different scales, it's very multiple, and it's an ongoing endeavour. I argue that it needs uh, an intense amount of work and care, and I use that word carefully, um, that effective engagement really relies on detailed insight and detailed evidence, that the relationships between the cultural partners and the communities and between different cultural partners take time, um, and they take support, that's financial support to enable participation. And when we engage our communities at, at the root of the success, it has to be really meaningful. It has to be in a way that meets their interests and it meets their needs. And it really foregrounds their expertise in the community. So Alison, I'm just gonna ask you a couple of quick questions. Very, and I'm not, I don't want to turn everything back on the island because I understand this is a much bigger topic, but I'm gonna to try to understand things in terms of my patch so I can make sense of things. So we can, so I can sort of ground what you say. 
personally, I, I would love to get a big gallery, a sort of get the National Academy outside London down to the Isle of Wight. So the National Academy Summer House using the old winter gardens in Ventnor, for example, or land at the Botanical Gardens. Are you saying that the age of big buildings uh, as sort of cultural drivers is over? Secondly, how can you help galleries, for example, on the island and Key Arts and the Carisbrook Museum and Dimbola Lodge, how could you help them be, for example, more resilient? And thirdly, how could you work out the worth of a model? So if I came to you as the Isle of Wight Council and say, we're gonna do this gallery here or this great idea there, could you, how would you turn around and be able to say, actually, it's a really bad idea, Bob, I wouldn't bother, or no, that's great. And I can prove to you that it'll drive all this fantastic regeneration and improve education and improve aspiration. I'll throw three big questions. Um, so uh, is the edge of big buildings over? Um, well, arguably, yes, I think there is a problem with big buildings because this, uh, unless you are able to fund them uh, in, in more creative ways, I okay. think there's a real reluctance from major arm's length funding bodies to invest in new assets because there yep. is such a need to invest in existing heritage assets. That's not to say you couldn't make that happen and there might be private sources of funding for that to happen. For smaller galleries, resilience is really tricky. For smaller galleries, that's about being really plugged into their communities. It's about collaborating. It's about responding to the policy agendas of inclusion, of well-being, and, and those aren't easy things to do. I mean, we put arts and culture on the front line and responding to to important. Do you mean tick boxing, Alison? Do you mean tick boxing to get money? No, it's quite the opposite, really. I mean, tick boxing okay. to get money is is possible, um, and I think it I think it it can work. But um, I think morally and ethically, we don't want to work that way. I mean, these yeah, yeah, are yeah. really good things for us to do, and I think it's um, having worked on quite a number of projects where that is done well. It really does change the sense and the feel yep. of an organisation. So just to give a quick example, if you were to yep. um, as you become more inclusive and you bring more voices in, more diversity. Um, you have multiple interpretive perspectives in your culture. Culture is very, very multiple. It means different things to different people. As you do that, you improve the offer more widely. Yep. You make an offer that makes sense to, to your core regular heritage visitors. Uh, that, uh, to be honest, actually, that was an incredibly good answer to a slightly dumb question. But as I did explain when the first time we met the, oh, a few days ago, I was going to ask some dumb questions because that's the best way to get great answers. So, Alison, I'm so gra grateful for your answers. Thank you so much indeed. I am now going to come on to who else have we got? Um, Ian, because I can see your picture next to Alison's on my screen. Uh, Ian, you're from the Local Government Association. Really important people because you know local government going undergoing some um uh, some changes probably some not great ones to do with planning but let's we're going to fight that separately how can local government and the local government association help and use culture for to increase worth and when i say increase worth it's not just about a visitor economy here yeah, but it's also about education being rooted in the community as alison says getting more people through your door because to mean more things to more people um, how can we, how can you and the Local Government Association help and suggest and drive that positive improvement? Yeah, thank, thanks Bob, that's a really interesting question. Uh, so I mean, Lee, I uh, represent uh, Culture, Stories and Sports at the Local Government Association. We're the membership body for councils in England and Wales. And we have twofold responsibility, one of which is to engage with Parliament and civil servants to explain this is what councils need to deliver for their communities. And the other is helping councils to learn from each other, to share best practice, tackle particular challenges and come up with new creative ideas for how they bring places together and enhance their communities. Um, councils are the big, biggest public spender in culture, um, over a billion pounds each year. So uh, more well, equivalent each year of a cultural recovery fund um, that was introduced. What's it spent in? What's that spent on? Um, so the, the core things are the, the cultural service infrastructure, so things like muse, uh, museums and libraries, which will be found in every place and therefore a great hook for um, keeping the supply chain going, putting on events, bringing communities together. Um, but they're also increasingly commissioners of, of other services. They run the 16% um, of theatres, so a lot of regional theatre um, is driven by councils and actually they probably own about 90% of the regional theatre buildings. Um, they have those huge assets, they have their um, planning services which can design, help design creative clusters, foster um, places where cultural and creative businesses want to uh, locate. There's some really good examples across the country of how they've really brought particularly historic buildings back into use in a completely different way. So, Ian, just a very quick point then, and I'm sorry, I should have said, please feel free to introduce yourself at the same time, but I can see you're doing that very eloquently. Ride Theatre on the Isle of Wight, sorry to bring it back to the island, it's empty. 
the town council, I think, are in the process of buying it. That's one example. What, what could you advise to do with that? Secondly, so my um, fellow Ireland and Jack Whitewood on the call now, would you be able to work for Jack to work out how we can drive clusters of you know artistic uh, endeavor? Because frankly, there's one happening in Ventnor. It's great. How can we turbocharge that to, to get all the good stuff we want from it? Yeah, so absolutely. We're actually turning our attention to theatres as a concentrated piece of work because um, of all the creative sectors, they've been hardest hit by the pandemic and will be probably slowest to recover. The rest of the creative industry is probably going to bounce back relatively easy, uh, notwithstanding issues in the supply chain and freelancers. Um, but yeah, that there's a lot of learning from councils to how a number of them have actually brought the, the assets where the provider has gone under, but they're leasing it back to the community so that the theatre remains a, a viable um, operator within their community so absolutely you can do that the other thing is really um picking up on Alison's point really which is it's no good having your your big shiny building operating on its own uh, if you are going to have a shiny building I would agree with her that actually it's the community engagement and the journey that you work on towards um your creative strategy that, that's really crucial there um so you actually have to think about actually how do we all interact how do we get benefits because if you can actually um, bring in that supply chain you're also going to um, increase a knock-on effect on the other parts of the economy you're going to start growing those jobs so that people locally feel they want to engage and the other thing about the creative and cultural sector in regeneration is that it creates communities where people want to live and the first question yep. Um, the businesses will say to council leaders when they're saying why should we come to your area is actually they ask about schools but then they ask what are the cultural facilities because they know that they're going to actually be able to attract and retain employees um, and similarly things that make um, communities positive for their residents also attract visitors so certainly in the Isle of Wight you've, you've got a, an absolute positive multiplier there that you could uh, seize on. I mean absolutely I just it's so frustrating that we've, we sort of basically gave up on cultural endeavour after World War II. Um, Ian, thank you so much indeed. Right, moving, sorry, I'm I'm sure it's my fault for waffling. I probably, we need to be moving this conversation on a little bit quicker, but it's entirely my fault. Right, Matthew McKee. Uh, Matthew, where are you on my screen? Uh, there you are, fantastic. Hi. Uh, thank you, please introduce yourself and, and say, just give us a couple of uh, tasty morsels about your, your interest in this debate and how you'd like to contribute to it. Okay, uh, so, uh... I've worked uh, for, for 20 years in, in kind of regeneration, the last 10 years in, in sort of heritage led regeneration, um, developed a lot of kind of new uses for historic churches, which are very important uh, uh, spaces for lots of communities for, for various kinds of things. Um, at AHF, we're uh, a social investor, um, so we don't just give out grants, but we also invest through loans and, and community shares um, and other forms of investment, so not just about uh, grants. Uh, for charities, social enterprises, um, community businesses, um, regenerating historic uh, buildings. And we're, we're running a programme at the moment, uh, finding new uses for historic buildings on the High Street. Um, so alongside Historic England's uh, High Street Heritage Action Zone, which you yeah. have one of in uh, the Isle of Wight. Um, so first of all, I think heritage is really vital to a place's uniqueness and sense of identity. And that's very important for economic development. Um, the not-for-profit sector is essential to any kind of long-term place strategy, particularly in terms of arts and culture. Um, and not-for-profit models are really important in places where the private sector is, uh, where it's weak. Um, and that's a really big problem in, in left-behind towns. And just like Ian was saying, um, I think a, an issue for, for left-behind towns, if you want to call them that, I know it's a controversial term, um, the economist Martin Sanbu has, has said that, that places need a, a strategy of attraction I think that's quite a good phrase um, Very good. For, for, for places. Um, so it's yeah. focused on connectivity, employment, um, but being able to maintain spend locally, that's that's really, really key. And, and investment in arts and, 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 and culture and so for social impact. Matthew, I'm going, to inter I'm going to interrupt you. Who could do a strategy of attraction for the Isle of Wight? Is that you? Do I ask you to do it? Do I get a bunch of people together? Who, 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 who does that? Um, I, maybe consultants like Alison um, could do uh, uh, something like that, but there, there's lots of good kind of uh, uh, organisations out there. There's, there's organisations in places like Plymouth, like Real Ideas organisation that I think could, could, could do that. We're working with a number of organisations in places like Great Yarmouth. Um, yeah. We, we, we call them Heritage Development Trusts that are working to kind of regenerate historic buildings in, in places right. like Yarmouth. Can I just uh, ask you another? Well, yeah, sorry. Uh, just very quickly on, I'm sorry to go back to Ride Theatre. Well, yeah. I didn't say to Ian is that Ride Theatre is derelict. 
but it's a beautiful building and it means a lot to the rider community and therefore it means a lot to me. So would we get somebody like you to come and say, please suggest how we can make ride theatre work as a derelict theatre, no chance of it being a theatre, but can we turn it into funky office space or you know, yeah. something really amazing for the community? Uh, one of one of one of our team can 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 advise on that if they if they haven't yeah. already. Um, and um, you know the, the example in Great Yarmouth that was going to use as the St George's Theatre there um, that has become a really sort of you know key space um, within the town. Yeah. And one of the streets within Great Yarmouth, King Street, was eighty percent vacant ten years ago, um, and now it's kind of eighty five percent occupied. And and a gallery is right at the centre of that, but they've also got a variety of kind of workspaces and, and houses and, and, and whatnot. Okay. So not for profit models really really yeah. important to, to 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 making places um, like Ride and, and and Great Yarmouth and yeah. um, Blackpool work. The only Yarmouth I'm interested in, my friend, is the one on the Isle of Wight, but nice one. <laughs> <laughs> um, Marissa, can we make sure that we get Architectural Heritage Fund, contact them about Ride Theatre and pass on their details to Ride Town Council? So I, I know it's being very parochial, but no time like the present. Sounds right. like an appointment. Matthew, thank you so much indeed. That sounds brilliant as ever. Uh, right, who's next on our list? Uh, Suzanne, Suzanne Johnson, University of Chichester. Suzanne, a couple of words about yourself, a few sentences about yourself, and then uh, what would you like to contribute to this, to this debate? Oh, hi. Um, so I'm Susie Joynson. Um, I'm a writer. I'm a published novelist uh, with Bloomsbury and New York Times, places like that. Um, and I work at the University of Chichester. So I've been working on a project called My Downs, My Home, uh, creative writing focused on the South Downs. Um, particularly, I live in Worthing, so it's particularly focused on Worthing, um, literally grassroots, as in we're wandering around the grass fields. Um, I'm looking at communities from the wards um, that score highly on the deprivation indices um, and figuring out how and why they do or don't access the green spaces um, okay. in relation to heritage connections with um, Worthing specifically. So we know already that green spaces have a lot to offer in terms of mental health, um, uh, depression, social interactions and all of those things. Also, of course, connected to exercise and all the benefits that come with that. We also know from Natural England's recent survey that um, people on the people from uh, low in, um, deprived socioeconomic backgrounds often um, have trouble accessing green spaces, and that children, in particular from low income families, have real troubles accessing green spaces. So my project is about um, finding out where the lanes are and the access to the downs behind Worthing, and how to get people up there linking to creative writing projects linked to the heritage of Worthing, which is one of those, which might arguably be called one of the inverted commas left behind places, um, which very similar to the Isle of Wight and it's got, you know, Jane Austen, Shelley, um, yeah, yeah. WH Hudson, all these big historical figures. It's also got uh, yeah. modernist architecture and really interesting things, all hidden, um, really in need of a visitors. <laughs> yeah. um, and and um, we've also got a huge amount of people moving from London, every time the train comes into the station, there's just more and more people moving. Um, so it's a really interesting time to capture okay. that energy with the people who are already no, that's here. Really, and that's really fascinating. So, uh, sorry for mispronouncing your name at the beginning. I do apologize, Susan. I mean, right. that, okay, I, I, I mean, there's two things that really grabbed me there. One, you, that we have got a little bit of an influx on the island as well, or people may be leaving because of COVID, so they're coming back. Very often people who might have moved 20 years time, but are moving maybe 10 or 15 years earlier, and yeah. they're coming back with young kids when they might have stayed in London with those kids until the kids were more grown up. But secondly, I, I do, my heart sinks when you, when you, when you say that all, all these people live really near green spaces but don't access them. And we probably have communities, not only in Ventnor, but also in Ryde, and maybe in, in 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 Newport as well that don't um, that don't for whatever reason get out to the really beautiful you know countryside around them, be it the footpaths, be it the cycle paths, etc. And I, I just I and mean, the more we can encourage that, it doesn't only have a positive impact on people's lives, uh, but it actually has a, a significant impact on their health as well because. Um, they're more likely to take exercise, they're more likely to feel better for it physically and mentally, etc. I, I just find it bizarre that people don't. Although I've got some very beautiful downs behind me on the island, but I have to say, you know, I probably don't get out and go for a walk as much as I should myself. So, yeah, yeah. yeah, so looking at those barriers is one of the hearts of the project. So things like transport, um, but big roads like the A27 of people who actually live about 18 minutes away from the bottom of the downs, but don't know how to get there, don't know how to yeah. cross. Um, and a sort of cultural um, 
thing where people have looked to traveling abroad or going to the coast rather than turning back to the green behind them as a sort of yeah. recreational space. Brilliant. Suzanne, thank you so much indeed. Right, I'm just going back to my list. Who else have we got? Seth, uh, Dr. Seth Giddings, Winchester uh, School of Art. Um, Seth, are you, you're the, uh, you're the penultimate, far away, and um, please say hello and a couple of sentences about yourself. Sorry it's taken so long to come to you, do apologise, um, and a couple of points about the debate. Thanks, Bob. Yeah, so I'm an Associate Professor of Digital Culture and Design at WSA, which is part of the University of Southampton. Yeah. I'm currently conducting a research project called Mapping the Creative Coast with Joe Stark at the University of Portsmouth for the Coastal Creatives Consortium of Regional Universities. The project addresses the digital creative economy in the region. Uh, it's got two strands. The first is the production of an interactive map of creative businesses and practitioners in the region. This is beginning to give a sense of both the scale and diversity of the sector and vital data on individual companies for further research. The second strand is a survey of the digital creative sector, uh, a survey, sorry, of the digital creative sector and industry bodies in the region to assess the demand for university industry collaborative research, development and educational needs and funding. And this will feed into both knowledge exchange strategies and research funding bids. Okay, okay, so they're both incredibly important. I mean, I hope the uh, interactive map, the Isle of Wight's on the interactive map, yeah? It is, yes. Yeah. Okay, is that enough Isle of Wight? I mean, we, are you making sure that you're hoovering everything up from the island, I hope, yes? I'll, I'll um, in a minute, I'll, I'll put a link to it in the chat so you can have a look. Um, we, okay, we've I think it's it, about a fraction of the, the, the interest in the area, but there's, there's definitely lots of little blue pins in the Isle of Wight. Good, we like that. That's good. We like little blue pins on the Isle of Wight. Um, and the survey of the digital, uh, uh, your survey sounds really interesting as well. And I hope that we contribute towards it. Um, fantastic. OK, thank you. Anything else from you? You've been fantastically concise. Uh, anything else? Uh, I had a few points coming out of that survey, Please. which I could run through yeah. if you want. Um, so they're, they're pertinent for this discussion. So yeah, yeah. the first one is that uh, now the geographical nor cultural identity of this region is, is self-evident or clearly defined, unlike the northeast or Bristol and Bath, the sense of the south okay. central of the place is, is less coherent. Um, yeah. even, the, even the consortium's emphasis on the coast has proved problematic in the survey with people in Winchester, the New Forest, questioning whether they, they fitted into this idea of a coastal identity. Uh, so it seems a cultural, that's a cultural issue but, as much as an industrial but, but Seth, for me, it doesn't, but that's not about, I mean, south centre is a bit of a sort of, it sounds quite modern, um, like this sort of, you know, uh, the, the New Forest is, has a fantastic, powerful identity of its own. The Sussex Downs has an identity of its own. Hampshire, with its association with you know, Jane Austen and all that, has an identity on its own. And clearly the Isle of Wight, because it's an island, um, has an identity on its own. So it, you're not dealing with one identity, but a lot of very small, but rather powerful and punchy identities, wouldn't, wouldn't you say? Doesn't that help us? I think it does, but there's a challenge there in how we connect together those different identities, get them to work together. Particularly, we've been looking, the, the consortium was set up to address uh, the government industrial strategy related funding. And a lot of those bids that go out through to arts and humanities departments is predicated on a, on a sense of, of, of a place or, a set, or an industry. And the last round, places like Bristol and Bath, South Wales, the Northwest, they, they sort of, uh, and London, they kind of grabbed these because they could uh, identify a coherent place. But isn't our coherence, the fact that we've got four or five punchy sort of artsy or sort of localised identities, and, and can't we just explain that better in the bidding process? Because we're not some sort of amorphous blob like Bristol and Bath, meow, sorry. Mm. But, you know, we're, we're actually, you know, New Forest is a you know, fantastically known locality and entity, the Isle of Wight. You know, likewise, Hampshire, likewise, the Sussex Downs, likewise. I don't see why we can't make that work for us. Because sure otherwise, we're having to invent and invent. We're having to invent an invented identity. Yeah, I, I take your point, but I think there is. I think that's certainly the ideal. The question is how you actually do that. What kind of networks of communication do we look at? Labs, local councils, universities, all these bodies are addressing these industries in in kind of different ways and looking. You know. To the southwest, to the southeast, to yeah. the, the coast. You know, yeah. maybe, maybe, maybe it's the politicians oh, writing yeah. letters to ministers and actually just um, supporting it more. But brilliant, Seth. Thank you very much. Anyway, and I'm sorry I'm taking way too long over this, but actually I'm enjoying the conversation, so I hope that you'll forgive me. Uh, Jack, um, last but by no means least, uh, Jack Whitewood. For everyone on the call, I will introduce him myself because um, I know what he does. He lives in Ventnor. 
He runs Ventna Exchange, which is a great coffee shop, but they sell amazing, quite strong beers. Um, they're sort of vinyl exchange, if I remember correctly, and it's just a great place to hang out. But more importantly, or as importantly, he also runs the Ventna Festival, um, which is a really excellent, small sort of mini Edinburgh festival type thing. Sorry to Jax to explain it in such a uh, sort of obvious way, but that's probably the best way to explain it. Uh, and he, Jack is also an arts, basically entrepreneur on the island, of which clearly we need more. So Jack, um, over to you. What have you, just listening to other people here, what do you think we can learn on the island from it? And what do you think, what, what expertise can we, can we bring over to the island to help us drive, um, to drive a sort of arts regeneration and rejuvenation on the Isle of Wight? Okay, hello, that's exhausting. So many people to meet. Lovely to, to hear briefly from all of you. Um, so yeah, I run a, a, with a team, a, a social enterprise, which uh, is an arts organization that is all about trying to build a, a creative ecosystem uh, in our locality. We run a small venue and a festival, as Bob said. Um, we run a big youth program and various other activities. And I guess for us, it was an experiment in how to try and do something differently. So we're a kind of grassroots um, exploration in how to uh, create regeneration from the ground up. Um, and I guess the main things I would say is that I definitely think we see our cultural uh, sector as an ecosystem and <laughs> every part has its part to play and i think it's about building that whole ecosystem to make something work and i think those big trees those big institutions are important but equally they sustain a lot of life but equally when a big tree a big tree falls it creates a lot of new life as well and a lot of new startups so i think it's uh, thinking of it as an ecosystem is a really great way to think of it um i think that um for us it's been the other really important thing is that artists understand that it's really important to sometimes to fail and when you're trying to be innovative and you're trying to explore new ways to do things uh, sometimes that means failing but when you translate that to a commercial environment that's obviously quite difficult and most people will not have the resource to consistently fail so i think sometimes what blocks things or what makes things difficult is uh, not having that resource or space to be able to to, to be innovative and to try new things and outside of the confines of places like universities it can be difficult to have that freedom to uh, innovate sometimes um, so i think that's a, a real challenge um, from the perspective of the island, I think there's a lot of potential and a lot of uh, a lot of good things on the ground, but it does have a, a physical infrastructure that's that's vulnerable, and I think the lack of a university and traditionally uh, inability to sustain talent um, has has been a problem. Um, and I think that it's interesting, obviously, in these COVID times, seeing whether that does reflect uh, a change in um, focus in terms of investment and for people where they deserve to live because the traditional focus around cities and that kind of migration into the cities has obviously been at the detriment of coastal uh, smaller towns and uh, communities. Um, it's not an easy problem to solve. I think it's it requires um, a whole range of different things, but I also think it requires us exploring and testing different ideas. I don't think um, everything has a definite answer. Sometimes we need to explore, and I think it's having that, that space to be able to test things on a small scale to see what works um, and to be able to have that sort of practical experience. Yeah. What, just before we go over to questions, and, and apologies again, I've taken rather longer on the introductions, but I've actually learned a great deal, so I hope other people have as well. What more do you think I could be doing on the island uh, just ab about this? Because we've heard lots of people from lots of experts, you've got a lot of expertise. So Matthew from the Architectural Heritage Funds, we could link him up with Ride Town Council. Is there, are there more that we could be doing with buildings and people in your neck of the woods? What could we be doing in Newport? I mean, what sort of grabs you when it comes to ideas and the expertise of the folks on this call, for example? I think you have to invest in people before you invest in buildings. Like okay. every, every organization is only as good as its team and every project is only as powerful as the people that make it. And I think it's having um, that kind of investing in people uh, to be able to you, it's all still very well renovating buildings and that, that's definitely important but in order to do that you need to have the people to be able to run them and to be able to manage them successfully so it's investing in those teams to have those people available ready to take on those those kind of activities i don't I mean, think there's enough I mean, collaborations with universities on the island for example and that kind of that lack of investment in in skills and training is a, is a challenge here so you said we have a lack of um a collaboration with universities i feel so yeah Okay. okay, that's a really good point. I mean, my frustration is the university revolution that re-energised Bournemouth and Brighton and Portsmouth and Southampton and indeed Winchester, it's completely passed us by. It's just so frustrating. 
uh, when we could have a great little campus in, in the top end of Newport, and there's lots that we could be doing there. Anyway, that's uh, let's we don't, don't get sidetracked on that. Joan, have we got folks asking questions? Yes, yes, absolutely, we do, Bob. There's some really interesting things coming in here. One of them yeah. is a really on-point question about what would success look like? So we're talking about Where? regeneration and regeneration in arts and culture. Okay. What would what would be aiming for? What would that look like mm -hmm. if we were successful? Would it would it be jobs? What what would be the ultimate goal? Is it not okay? Is it not? And um, everyone just put your hands up and, and coming into a free for all. But is it not everything? And is it not rather dependent on place? What's going to be successful in Bedford? I mean, not even Jack and I would agree on that because I, I want the National Academy. To, to come down to Ventnor and use the winter gardens. And I want another 200,000 visitors into Ventnor. Plus I want it linked in with the schools and you know local artists working out of that. Uh, and Jack might not even agree with that. So the, the problem is, I think it rather depends on your perspective and where, whereabouts you are. So, but I mean, does anyone want to come in and just say what success to them looks like in, in their particular field or more widely? Who, who wants to take that? Matthew. Um, for, for us, things like vacancy rates can be, you know, one measure okay. of, of, of success. Um, you know, things like footfall are, are really important um, as, as well. Um, and then you can do more kind of technical things like the, there was a recent kind of study that arts organisations for every pound that, pound that they generate, there's a multiplier effect of kind of £1.25 in, in the rest of the economy. So there's a range of things that you can do, but in terms of people locally seeing more uh, uh, shops and whatnot that aren't vacant is really really important okay. and seeing okay. more people around them in the town center is really really important okay so that that's a general but that's about i mean that's brilliant but that's a there's a practical success story so vacancy rates footfall etc alison did you have your hand up yeah i did bob i was just going to say that in terms of um success some of those harder to reach or underserved communities sometimes asking them what outcomes look like for them as well and not yeah. not pre not pre-guessing that it might be jobs or it might be a particular yeah. outcome that we might attribute um but having consideration to ask well, what does it look like for you and then actively working yeah. to achieve that okay i mean that's one of the big learnings from tates and ives not that i'm slagging off cornwall oh no um i mean that's one of the big learnings from tates and ives it was rather plonked there by a bunch of people from london wasn't it so if we were getting stuff and jack actually makes a point you know it's going to have to be sort of people first ground up mm -hmm. kind of community rooted because that's where it's effectively a it survives out of season but that's the way it actually binds into the community your community with it so it enriches everybody not just visitors yeah, I think that's right. And I think things can come from the top down as long as they're coming from the bottom up as well and, and that yeah. they work mutually together because you do need external influences and you do need them to kind of embed. And I, yeah. I think, and Jack, I love that term ecosystem. I think it's just really effective and it, it gives a sense of that multiplicity and that interdependence of everything. I mean, we had that slightly on the Isle of Wight. We've just launched Film White, which is basically there's Film Cornwall, there's Film Yorkshire, there's now Film White. And that's been set up by somebody who's led the project working completely for free. Then the, the, the lady concerned, I mean, she's you know, not, not, not badly off in her own right because she's a, a London based investor, but she's also passionate about the island and is based on the island. And she's worked with cultural um, and arts groups to support them. And that shows that actually people from outside working with people on the island and the island council and me can actually get something done. And indeed, I think Britbox's first series, first standalone series, The Beast Must Die, which is like a 1930s novel set in the island. Was, was actually filmed down on the island, which is good because all the Victoria, Queen Victoria, she lived on the island, but it's all being filmed up in Yorkshire, which is a little bit frustrating because it'd be nice for us to get that, to get that cultural stuff down to the island uh, and the jobs and support with it. Anyone else have anything on this question before Joe shouts out another question? Seth or, or anyone else, anyone, anyone to anything to add? If you haven't, no worries. Um, okay, uh, Joe, next question. Yeah, so I think actually there is an interesting follow up from that, which is what does an effective consultation look like? Do arts organisations have the capacity and skills to engage in that? So how do we create that bottom up development? OK, isn't it just a question of asking everyone? I'd say it's such a ridiculously dumb answer. Sorry. I, I, I mean, is it just a, OK, Alison, over to you to save my blushes now. No, I think um, there's a lot of asking people to be done. Um, I think what consultations aren't a straightforward survey is that you get a large number of people to respond to. I think they're fine. Um, I think we must think about consultation as a continuum 
where on the one hand you're you can be passing information and updating people and on the other hand it's a really really sort of deep involved process that just takes quite a long time uh, and it might be through creative consultation or participatory activity and then um, it's, it's where we've got a shared language we can talk about public engagement and consultation in a way that we all understand because it is a, it's tricky and people might talk about collaboration or co-creation or co-production or participation and not quite mean the same things and that's quite challenging so consultation takes again a lot of time a lot of effort it really yeah. understands people have got barriers to access that um, you know not bsl interpreting not providing things in large print um, going out and seeing audiences and meeting people on their own turf on their own territory and finding ways to engage with more diverse communities and interests so it's, a, yeah, I mean, it's not a straight answer, it's, it's complicated. No, no, but is, isn't the problem is that once governments come up with an idea, some minister or some councils come up with a brain, or some MPs come up with what they think is a brainwave idea, and they go and try to sell it, if people say, well, we don't want that, we'd rather have this, then that's pretty much the end of the consultation because the, the politician or the ministry pushes on anyway uh, and frankly sort of goes through the process of pretending um because it finds one or two people willing to chat i mean maybe i'm being a bit cynical but i mean i'm i think i'm afraid to say that i think government action can sometimes work like that can't it it can do so if you've got an idea if, if you've got a policy idea and you're, you're you're basically asking people do you agree with this thing and there's no real meaningful way in which people can can um, can engage with that that's tricky something else is happening there but if you're starting from point of saying what is this local place what is the setting what are the what is the significance and what are the opportunities and what your consultation does is it derives local people's needs, it helps understand the barriers, and it looks at people's motivations and ways in. If you give people meaningful ways in, you're helping them down that path. And then from that, that bottom-up consultation, you're then able to give some shape to the idea and to the solution. And again, maybe both things do need to happen at the same time, but at all times we need to understand what it is that we're actually doing and what are we trying to achieve when we do it. Thank you very much indeed. Matthew. I think some of the kind of smaller projects there are, are really important like some okay. some some big projects um can be really risky but because people can be quite inflexible about changing what that big project looks like yeah. even if the consultation says something different so yeah. the importance of some smaller projects where flexibility or or failure or change yeah. is less kind of um it, it means less loss of money or public face or, or whatnot is really to have those as part of the mix in, in kind of any play strategy really yeah no i mean i think the problem is that government are, hot, are wedded to big projects and some really dumb ones not mention any by name hs2 jack i just want to say i think another really important thing is when you're really embedded in a community you just start to understand behavior so as well as asking people what they think we look at what they do so you know that's not always the same thing what people say and what they do and i think sometimes when you have that you know, what's great with your, as a grassroots organization is we're really embedded in our community and we see them every day. And you start to understand um, how, how the area works and what people do and their behavior. And that helps you to be able to make uh, judgments in a way which is quite rooted in that place. So I think that, that kind of real understanding of behavior and arts organizations are quite good at understanding uh, their audience's behavior. We understand how to sell tickets and we do that because we understand who will buy them and when they'll buy them and what will appeal to them we understand the barriers that certain people play uh, you know facing entering going through those doors of a cultural space and what they can do but i think it's all about being really embedded in that place and you start to understand that but yeah i think behavior as well as asking people what they want is important so i mean in a place like Ventnor, if you had i mean forget about money let's say money was no objective how would you um how what are the next steps of growth for example for what you're doing in Ventnor? jack you frozen is that me or is that you jack are you frozen you there joe can you see yeah has, it's has jack, jack frozen, jack frozen. No. Uh, you know he's back with us so jack did you hear that question not really sorry <laughs> okay so forget about money so if it's just ideas regard and you could have whatever you wanted in Ventnor, what would be the next stage of, of a positive evolution of what you were doing to, to rope in more people, to get more people engaged and involved, you know, what does it look like in, in, in a couple of sentences? Well, big question. Okay, well, I think basically it's all about, it's not about having one master man, one architect or one designer that just decides yeah. what the creative ecosystem should be. It's about us investing in the people and seeing what comes out of it. So okay. if you invest in really great creative talent, no one decided what Tennyson was going to write about. No one decided what these great poets and writers are going to do. It's about investing in the skills and talent, and then we will discover what the creative scene of that place is. So I okay. think it, it's about investing in that, and then they will decide what things they need to make that happen. And it might yeah, be... Well, but it might when be. you say investing in that, does that mean just 
um, up at the free school in Ventnor, there's more of a focus on music and art, or does it mean that we just encourage the University of Southampton or, U or Winchester to actually set up a small scale camp campus on the Isle of Wight? Again, I mean, I'm just wondering how you develop sort of artistic um, enterprise uh, and artistic um, and cultural enterprises. Well, I guess people need skills, they need space and they need time. So yes, it involves sometimes formalized education. So through things like universities, but it might also just be people having the, the space and time to be able to afford to try new things and to try startups and to do different things. You know, that's very difficult for a lot of people to be able to fit into their lives. And I think that people need that kind of space and time to be able to invest in that almost everything you know every creative project it takes time to work and i think a lot of people won't ever get started because they just don't have the resource and the time available to be able to, to try that okay jack thank you skill space and time good answer thank you right um uh, joe sorry next question Yes, so there's a couple of questions coming in about the UNESCO Biosphere Reserve designation, which now, of course, covers the South Downs and the Isle of Wight, and how that can be linked into creative and cultural work to provide a kind of uh, research and income generation uh, that is humanities and arts based. Yeah, uh, my simple answer to that is I would love to know. So, Suzanne, uh, do you want to kick us off? Because Brighton and South Downs, uh, biosphere, the, the, you, the Isle of Wight is now a biosphere, and it means nothing in UK law, should it maybe? Suzanne? Um, <clears throat> yes, I think it would be interesting to know more about that as well. Um, I um, need to check out, find out a bit more about it, but um, I just wanted to quickly yep. add a little bit about um, how, the, how to um, consult with people um, on particularly on green space um, yeah. projects if they have a link between research and actually engaging with the community um, and one of the main things is relevance um, and so there's not much point talking to a community say for example if you wanted to um, talk to people who live somewhere near the South Downs who um, are um, single parents for example there's no point talking to that specific community that a policy-led um, directive has targeted unless it's relevant to them so within the current COVID context it might be staycation health can't go anywhere can't travel that that far anyway and how do we re rethink that and how that relates to that specific community and how that can actually factor in their day-to-day -day life and without that relevant example um, or bit of information that you don't get the joining up in the consultation period with the people who are trying to attract into the downs and biosphere and etc yeah fantastic okay Suzanne thank you very much indeed A anyone else on that or the um the point about the biospheres anyone because I mean the thing is about the biospheres it's great to have the designation but I'm not quite sure I get the sense that places haven't yet worked out to do what to do with it because it doesn't come with any government love and attention. It doesn't come with any cash. Jack? What I would say though is it's like certainly locally on the island here is it's brought together organisations that may not have traditionally seen themselves as being in the same area. So we work much more with our places like the AOMB and environmental organisations than we did in the past. And as a culture, heritage, arts, heritage and environmental sector, which we did not necessarily correlate together in the past, this gives us an understanding and a sort of shared terminology that we now understand. And I think, you know, you talk about all these great poets and writers in the past, as you say, the landscape and the environment was a key part of that inspiration. And, and you know, as a physical physicality of, of an island is a very geographical thing. And so our environment is a big part of our, our culture. It affects the way that every, we work day to day in every way. So I think that um, it does have power in that sense. And I think it is bringing together different parts of the, the sector to work together. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I, and I mean, it, certainly, it literally shapes Ventnor because you've got that massive Ventnor down behind you. And actually, I was looking at old pictures 100 years ago. Ventnor Down used to be just the downland. And it was only after Garibaldi came to the island in the second half of the Victorian era and brought with him, Itali we started it planting Italian oaks on the island, which are evergreen oaks. And obviously somebody planted one on, on the back of Ventnor Down. And now Ventnor Down is covered year round in beautiful uh, Italian evergreen oaks. So yeah, so I just thought I'd throw that in for no particular reason. Uh, Joe, over to you. Yeah, no, I think that there's some really interesting things that are potentially very fruitful in terms of arts and humanities research. And there's a whole area of environmental humanities yeah. where there could be really interesting work that is okay. done to create those relationships. I think, Alison, that's your, Joe, that's your next project. That's well, your next lots, project. What to do with the biosphere? 
Well, we've actually, in, we've got folk who are really interested. I think Alison on the call is actually in that area. Oh. She has some, you want to come in, Alison, maybe? Alison, sorry, if I missed you. Oh, oh my God, have I, have I gone? Your camera's oh, off, Bob. Uh, I, sorry, um, I'm, uh, uh, sorry, sorry. Okay, I accidentally hit the wrong button, slightly embarrassingly. Um, Alison, sorry, did you want to come in there? No, I didn't, I didn't have my hand up. Did you want me to answer a question? <laughs> Well, to be honest, no, only that. Joe said Alison, and then I panicked and hit the wrong button. Anyway, right, that's, that's enough for okay, my well, organisational skills. Back to, back to Joe. The next question, next set of questions then. And uh, we've got several that have come in on infrastructure in one way or another about okay. repurposing buildings for, for mm -hmm. artists, about traffic and pollution, and mm -hmm. about signage and yep. how they are important in terms of artistic and cultural regeneration. How can well, we develop ways of getting people to access in those very kind of nitty gritty ways the infrastructure so, and, and that they need? Joe, when, when you're talking about signage, are we talking about, I'm sorry to be, again, so to, are we talking about there's brown signs on the side of the road? Are we talking I'm not about actually sure what they mean in the question, but I assume so because it's questions related okay. to road signage and attraction signage. Okay, so, it, it, okay, so infrastructure. Uh, infrastructure does anyone yeah. does anyone have uh, anything they want to say about the infrastructure either of a place? I mean, okay, here's a question for me. We've got the branch line regeneration. We've got fifty thousand pounds from the Department of Transport to do an investigation into reopening branch lines. And one of the re one of the reasons I want that is because I want us to study whether it's feasible to reopen the branch line, uh, the extension from Shanklin into Ventnor. Uh, because you then get more people who can directly travel to Ventnor, so it's about two and a half hours from London. But then if we're thinking about the Ventnor Festival in the summer or about, you know, turning the Winter Gardens in Ventnor into some kind of permanent attraction um, and permanent gallery, for example, Queen Victoria stuff plus, you know, punk. We do old, very old, very traditional and very funky quite well on the island. It seems to be our sort of schlick. So we do Olive White Festival and, you know, Queen Victoria. Um, so if we can if we can mix that sort of very traditional and slightly punky, can we actually then drive that regeneration process? So that's my contribution. I want to reopen the branch lines to get that, to get people visiting my community. So make Newport accessible from Portsmouth and to make Ventnor accessible from London. So you could do potentially a day trip or more likely to come down all the way down to Ventnor, jump on a little bus into the beautiful town centre in Ventnor, spend lots of lovely money, go and see the artists and do that sort of good stuff. Anyone else want to talk about infrastructure in the last five minutes? Matthew, is that one for you? I, I, I've got more of an answer. I think Alison wanted to come in. But oh, I sorry. Um, I do apologise. Alison. Um, I, mean, I, was, I, I read that question, Joe, actually. That's about um, uh, how when you've got a small museum off the beaten track, do you attract people in? Um, and yeah. then how can you send people back off? I mean, I Good think idea. this is a problem whether you're a small museum or a big museum. It's um, it's realising that your visitor's journey starts from when they're at home or possibly even the day before and they, you know, they think about coming. Um, are we investing in websites? Have we got joined up marketing? Um, what do you what do you do as an organisation where, where you sort of put yourself in the shoes of different visitors and say, well, how are they visiting us? How are they how are they arriving? Where are they parking? What are they doing? Where are they stopping for lunch? Um, it's not always the case that to have lunch at your institution. You want to be pushing them out into the local community as well. So it's having a really holistic sense of that visitor offer. Um, and lots of places seem to have destination management and destination marketing. But as a, as a as kind of as a user of culture, I often go out, I haven't got a clue what's going on. I can't really find stuff. And someone said, oh, that was that amazing thing. Did you go to it? I think, no, I didn't see it. So actually, I just think it's really challenging. I mean, we're actively looking for culture and sometimes we miss it. So it's hardly surprising people who maybe aren't looking for it don't see it. So I think that should definitely be invested in. As you say, Bob, also that physical infrastructure as well. It's the marketing and the branding that sits on top of it and, and pulls everything together in a, in a, a set of visitor offers for people who live, work or, or visit your area. Brilliant. Alison, thank you so much indeed. Um, anyone else I want to come in on that at all? Uh, Matthew. Uh, I was just going to come in on the artists uh, yeah. question about sort of um, artists kind of being able to use space for, for free. You know, artists create value for places. Um, it's not always monetary. It can be about confidence. It can be about the way a place looks. Uh, so the, the, the suggestion about what, what went on in Lewisham, I think how property is owned and how it kind of um, helps to kind of cultivate that value is really important. So 
um, we've we've worked with with Ride Town Council um, on a, on a couple of projects, and and how they could maybe do that is 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 really important. But landlords often don't want to do that, so there is a role for the public sector or, or not for profit sector in doing that. But it's very very important, and and I think as we get more derelict um, town centre property, mm -hmm. how landlords have worked with um, to maybe bring in some, yeah. some uses that are temporary um, or meanwhile uses is really, really important. And, and, and that does need some place in, in, a, in, a, in a strategy as well for, for how you develop kind of artist and cultural uses in, in a town. You make a really good point. I mean, we have this uh, dreadful planning bill coming up. Sorry, I probably shouldn't be so negative about it. But, um, we have this dreadful planning bill coming up and actually I'm going to be putting down a lot of amendments on it anyway. But one of the amendments I'm going to be putting down is compulsory purchase because we have some fantastic buildings on the Isle of Wight and it takes forever to compulsory purchase. And it's very easy to get around compulsory purchase because compulsory purchase is weighed in favour of landowners for good reasons because of the link between freedom and uh, you know, freedom from arbitrary arrest and arbitrary government back, you know, a few hundred years ago. But really, there are some fantastically beautiful buildings in Ventnor and even some sort of quite good spaces like old garages, which if the council could buy them or the town council could buy them and just say, right, here's a space for a dozen artists. Somebody figure it out. Somebody, go and, you know, work out how we're going to get the money for that. That would be a really good way to revive a town. Because the fact is, if Ventnor, for example, had this reputation, which it sort of has as an artsy town, it helps encourage people to come there and it sort of overlooks a slight negative feel that some of the bits of the town are a bit run down because it's got the vent festival because it's a fun place because you associate it with expression and for all these reasons uh likewise in in newport we've got a lot of empty buildings so again um uh, it's a, it's landlords thinking creatively but it's also maybe people government giving power to local councils to compulsory purchase which i, I would be putting down amendments for That's great yarmouth have done that really really well judiciously okay. and carefully and i think the right, right to yeah. regenerate the, the 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 new kind of uh, right to regenerate um that is being proposed is a really important thing it's not just public sector assets that are part of that but private sector yeah. assets are also part of it what sorry what is the right to regenerate uh, matthew uh, so it's the new mhclg proposals um that are um about kind of um, community groups or I guess developers as well potentially been able to kind of um, yeah, uh, yeah. buy or, or take ownership of, of public sector land but it's at the moment oh, yeah. it seems to be defined purely in terms of public sector land and, and our point is that in a lot of places it's it's, it's private sector uh, uh, owners that are equally if not more uh, uh, so than, than Matthew do you have any do you have any articles on that or can you send me a link to anything I'll, I'll send I... you our, our response um, that, yes, we, that we put together for uh, for it yeah. was this was this part of the white paper proposals no it's separate, it's separate. Uh, and um, so it's it's something that kind of at the moment there's no proposal it, it was about the um, I can't quite remember Ian might be might be able to um, it was um, part of the uh, community rights um, that hasn't been quite worked. Anyway, I'll find the details and send it to you. Okay, fantastic. Are we, what are we like for time, Jo? Um, I think we, we're just ready to wrap up now, I are think. We, are, we, are, we, are we wrapping up? We've got do, do one, we... one minute to go. So. Okay, uh, I was going to ask everyone to wrap up, but unfortunately, if you've got less than a minute, I'm just going to... Can I just say that was incredibly interesting. Uh, well, I, I learned a lot from it, so I hope other folks did as well. Um, Strategy of attraction. Okay, I just for everyone on this call, minus Jack, because obviously he's already on the island. If any of you are looking to do pilot schemes or want to do projects when it comes to the strategy of attraction or to help help build resilience or for anything to do with your work, can you please come and talk to me? Um, and so we can actually get you down to the island to do good work down here because we really want to do this and we want to make a success of this. So Bob, I could just come in there and say maybe that SIA, the Southampton Institute for Arts and Humanities, would be really happy to facilitate anything, anything like bringing together people and creating a kind of roundtable environment, working with you to, to make that Joe, type of stuff happen. Joe, come down. We'll have a coffee in Ventnor Exchange um, uh, with a few other people uh, in June or so and come down. We'll have a chat and see what the options are. And we'll have a new council officer and, and, and council leadership team as well. So we can maybe do something then. Yeah, yeah, we'll definitely do that. Okay, well, so I mean, I'm afraid we're running out of time. I, I'm just gonna thank everybody for being on the call for an, an amazing, really thought provoking webinar. On behalf of the Institute uh, of, uh, of Arts and Humanities at the University of Southampton, I'd like to thank you all for your participation. 
And um, I know that this is only the beginning. We hope that it's going to be something which really kicks off a lot of ideas, interaction, and continued communication. Um, so don't forget that this call has been recorded. You can pass on the, the link to others. And um, thank you very don't much. Send the government the bit when, don't send the government the bit when I'm slagging off the planning, please. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, goodbye to all our, our, our viewers. <laughs> thank you very much.